Hello, and welcome to Book Break for Greece Public Library. I'm Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here, and I moderate our Pints and Prose book discussion group. I'm joined, as always, by my partner in reading crime, Claire. Yes, my favorite reading partner. So, so I am Claire. I moderate As the Page Turns here at the library and also our historical group on Facebook. And today, we have another special guest with Very us. Very special guest. We have Mindy with us. Hi, everybody. So, so my name is Mindy Wallington. I'm a library assistant at the Greece Public Library, and I just started here in June. I'm very excited to be on my first book break. Excellent. Um, so Mindy, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, your reading life, what kinds of things you like to read? Sure. So I focused on for this one with two books that had very strong nostalgic ties for me. Mm-hmm. So, but they're very, very different topics. So my background is mostly in history and I was a women's studies major too. So I really like reading about the history of women, what they were doing. And I also minored in anthropology so I could do archeology span so I could know what women were doing before there was writing. So. Very cool. Yes, I, I tend to skew heavily toward history in my mm-hmm. reading preferences. Okay, uh, mostly nonfiction or just some historical fiction? sneak in there too? That's a great question. I started (laughs) with historical nonfiction. I tried to read it again and it's just, it just doesn't read the same way as when you're 13 Mm -hmm. to when you're 40. But the Jean Platy books, the historical fiction are what got me hooked on English history. And yeah, and then I kind of transitioned into nonfiction. So excellent. All right. Well, would you like to start us off with one of the books you brought today? I would love to. Okay. So the two books I'm going to talk about today are All Things Wise and Wonderful by James Harriet, which was first published in 1976. And the second book I'm going to talk about is The Library of Fragile History, which was published in 2021 by Andrew Pedigree and Arthur um, Derwerdewin. And I'm going to start with The Library of Fragile History. Mm-hmm. And my shameful admittance is I didn't finish it because the book is dense. <laughs> So I've got some notes on the first few chapters of it, but it was packed. It was a book where I was taking notes the entire time, like I was still in college and I was going to be tested on this book, but it was fascinating. So it covered right from the beginning of Mesopotamian cuneiform tablets, right up until 2002, where they um, commissioned the Alexandria Library rebuilding in Hmm. Egypt. So... I'm happy to share. I have jotted down some fun yeah, facts. Yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about it. I yes, love well, I, I love fun facts, so <laughs> indulge me. <laughs> me too. So, oh, this is great. I can't wait to pull these out at, like, the opportune moment when I'm talking to patrons or something. Um, so the book focused on a cycle of growth, decline, and rediscovery and recovery with libraries. And I was really mm. fascinated by that cycle. And it started with stories about old forgotten libraries being accessed um, and they had anecdotal evidence like Giovanni Boccaccio walked into this Italian monastery in the 1300s and he just walked in the door. There was no door. There was open. There was no key, nothing. And he saw grass growing on the windows and he saw like birds in there and everything and he was appalled. And it was this library that was in a monastery, and it was full of all these treasures. And um, to hear his description, I mean, I've walked into archives like that, too, now. And it's like, oh. And then you realize something needs to be done, and then you get into the recovery cycle. And Hmm. uh, I like to think that Boccaccio kind of kicked off that 1300s Italian monastery recovery. Um, But sticking with fun facts, I learned about... The Assyrian Empire of Mesopotamia started writing on cuneiforms, baked clay tablets, and then they transitioned to Egyptian papyrus scrolls that were hard to organize and store. And around the third century, we moved to using codices, which were parchment papers of pages bound together in a book. And challenges around storing cuneiform tablets and scrolls where they were really hard to organize. And But they still had substantial libraries. Like in Nineveh, they would have tablets of 35,000 in these libraries hmm. that were royal palaces and temples. And they were very exclusive. So... I always thought libraries were open to everybody, and I didn't quite realize how exclusionary they used to be. Mm -hmm. But in the end of one of these cuneiform tablets in Nineveh, it had an inscription that said, one who is competent should show this only to one who is also competent, but may not show to the uninitiated. (laughs) So I like to think of that as like an early library card, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then the book transitioned to talking about the Romans, determining the access and purpose of the library. Should they be silent? Should they be sociable? Should there be wine? And what to do with their tenth? There should definitely be wine. <laughs> Bowls of wine are a must. <laughs> <laughs> Bowls of wine. Mm-hmm. For symposiums. Um, and what they should do with redundant texts. So they were talking about the age-old question of weeding in the Roman libraries. And it's just something that really resonated with me, too. And what I thought was really interesting, when they transitioned from papyrus scrolls to books, they had to decide what to recopy and what was left mm. to rot away. Ooh. Mm-hmm. So we think of Gilgamesh and you know all the other works that could have just easily have been left to fade away. And... And that was really, really fascinating to me. And the last fun fact I had on my list for the Library of Fragile History was talking about how they reused parchment papers to make Mm -hmm. palim sets, which I found fascinating because in my former job in an archive, I actually got to see some of the process of uncovering palim sets Mm -hmm. with using this new technology with lasers and prisms and and all these um, fun new imaging technology. They can actually see what was written underneath newer text, which is totally amazing. So it's kind of like uncovering a painting. It really is amazing. Very cool. Yeah. um, Parchment was so precious Mm -hmm. um, that they would just they would use it and then if they decided they needed to reuse the piece of parchment they would actually just scrape the top layer off to get rid of the ink and then reuse the parchment wow because it was it was so expensive and precious who knew Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it was a lot of investment they said a substantial book could cost the skin of a hundred calves or more Mm -hmm. which that's a, a lot of Parchment. A lot of animals. It yeah. is. It really is. Mm-hmm. So so that Library of Federal History is a subject to me because I used to work in an archive and I was really interested to learn more about the history of libraries. Now that I'm working in a public library, it was fascinating to me to see the uncovering of the Alexandria Library in 2002. And it started in 1974 when Nixon visited Egypt and asked to see the site of the Alexandria Library and nobody could tell where it was. Hmm. So then some scholars got on it, and some international committees started forming. And then in 1990, there was a a commitment of hundreds of millions of dollars from international um, donors. And they made a decision to build a new library in Alexandria, and they opened that in October 2002. Wow. Bucket list. Very cool. Yes. Nice. Well, that's fascinating. Kind of a a meta take on libraries and mm-hmm. what we do every day. But it's it's fascinating to hear that, you know, some of the the questions that we're still grappling with, librarians have been grappling with apparently since literally the beginning of time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. I wonder what they called weeding back then. That'd be really interesting yeah. to know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. And then the second book that I wanted to talk about with strong nostalgic ties to me was um, Totally Different Topic, All Things Wise and Wonderful by James Harriet. You guys might be familiar with the remake of the new All Creatures series that mm-hmm. just came out. Um, but the story that really resonates with me is um, a snippet about um, this pair of dogs, Jingo, a white bull terrier, and Skipper, his little corgi friend. And this story is... It's very um, emotional for me because when I was growing up, my first dog was named Jingo oh. after this pair in the... He did not have a skipper friend, though. <laughs> he just had me and my brothers. But um, the story is kind of precious, kind of heartbreaking, but also refreshing and, and full of hope at the end. Um, Jingo died of jaundice. Skipper started to fade from grief. The farm couple were really worried about Skipper, and they went to the breeder who... Um, who bred Jingo, they had a new litter, they brought home a puppy, and it was very climactic in that the vet was showing up to put the dog to sleep because he was fading fast, and the puppy came in, and Skipper started showing more interest and and being rejuvenated and lived for many happy years after that. And I thought that was really precious. But I just couldn't believe when I read this book for the first time, I was like, Jingo, that's our dog's name. And my mom's like, yeah, I wonder why, where that came from. (laughs) So she totally pulled it from that book, that series. But I grew up on a farm, and a lot of the stories that James Harriet talks about in running a farm in the 1930s was applicable to me living on a farm in the 1980s. Mm. New York, because it was a seventh generation farm. We were doing a lot of the same stuff we were doing in the 1930s then. So. Interesting. Yeah, it was a, a really neat way of kind of looking at probably what life was like for my grandparents. Mm-hmm. 
So. I love when we have a special guest because it's like, who knew this about you, Mindy? <laughs> you know, this we is learn like, so much about our coworkers by getting them to talk about books. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I loved James Harriet. Mm-hmm. I remember reading those books when I was younger, and my brother would say he could tell I was reading one because I would be slapping the chair. I was laughing so hard at some <laughs> of them. So he's like, mm-hmm. oh, she's slapping. <clears throat> she's reading those Harriet books again. <laughs> So. Yeah, slapping the chair, bawling your eyes out, you yes. know, one or the other. Oh, I know. Yeah, I didn't realize till yeah. I tried to reread them later, like, how many sad things there were. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, and I watched the original TV show with mm-hmm. my parents. I remember that. And yeah. Really liked it. I have not watched the new one yet. I haven't either. I watched the original series, too. So, um, but the music really sticks with you, too, as soon as you hear it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Mindy, for bringing those books to us. Oh, happy to. Very cool. All right. Claire, do you want to go next with one of those? So I feel like I'm really going to, you know, not be deep today. (laughs) (laughs) So my first one was a mystery that I got for um, Book of the Month Club, and it was called Daisy Darker. Mm -hmm. So this one, it, it took me a bit to get into it, but once I hit the midpoint, it was like, Foom, I was I was sucked in. I was rolling. And about the best thing I can say about it is I didn't guess the ending. So in a thriller, okay. I mean, really, what other what else yeah, is there? Sure. So um was it believable? Well, it didn't really pass the Claire plausibility test. Didn't pass the sniff test. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? The ride was so enjoyable I, I didn't care. Were the char- characters likable? No, not really. Uh But the setting was wonderfully gothic, and the story Mm. wrapped up pretty nicely at the end, so I went with it. So here's the setup. Um, After years of isolation, the Darker family is reuniting for Nana's 80th birthday party at her home, which is called Sea Glass House, and it is set on the Cornish coast of, mm. of Great Britain, mm. and the thing with this house is it's surrounded by water at high tide, so you mm. really can't get to it except by boat, and when there's a storm, travel is pretty much impossible. Mm. So on this night, adding to the mystery, of course, Nana has chosen to reveal the terms of her will. Of so course. so we have the perfect storm. We have a storm, we have everyone isolated on this house, so you start to get very much Agatha Christie and mm-hmm. then there were none vibes. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the stroke of midnight, Nana bites the dust. <laughs> and then each How hour convenient. afterwards, <laughs> yeah, someone else dies. So ah. no one was happy with the will. Um, Everyone in this family has secrets. We all know how I love a good secret. But Mm. the narrator is the youngest daughter of, or granddaughter of Nana. Her name is Daisy Darker. When she was born, she had a heart condition. She was also the youngest of her two sisters, all of whom were named after flowers. Her father was a musical conductor who really preferred doing that than being with his family. Mm -hmm. Mom was an inspiring actress who didn't get to fulfill her career wishes because she had a family, and she was pretty much home with the three three children while her husband was off gallivanting you know in Rome and so forth you know conducting his orchestra Um, so the eldest daughter was a vet a veterinarian she hasn't really had a happy life Lily was the the typical middle wild child and she has a child out of wedlock um, a, a young niece that Daisy was particularly close to so what I enjoyed in this book um was the setting on the island and just that locked room kind of Mm -hmm. atmosphere in the mystery. Uh, I love that the descriptions of the house were fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would love to visit this Victorian house with its turquoise tiled roof and has 80 clocks on the wall. It just sounded really quirky and fun. Um, But the, the thing that bugged me is each chapter, like, is revealed because... They find this mysterious VHS tape, and then they all watch it together. And it's like one of the secrets is kind of revealed in the tape. And then Daisy gives you backstory, like mm-hmm. into what this particular event and mm-hmm. what are the undercurrents of the room. So 
That kind of bugged me a little bit. Um, but so you do work backwards from the meeting, the will, and then each person kind of mm-hmm. takes a road back and she kind of fills you in on the story. I can't really tell you much more about that because I don't want to blow it if you're going to read it, mm-hmm. um, you know, or tell you what it reminds me of. But uh, it was entertaining. It, it reads very quickly. So if you're in the mood for like a, a gothic mystery Agatha Christie-esque, you know, I suggest Daisy Darker. Nice. So I had a couple of follow-up questions for you, Claire. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. What did you think about the pace of the book? You kind of touched on. Pace of the book? I would say yeah. it, it is good. It, yeah. like, kept it me turning those pages. Moves. It kept me, it moves. It moves pretty quickly. Like, the beginning, I was kind of, ah, I don't know. But, you know, once I got to the midpoint, I couldn't put it down, and I nice. had to know what was okay. going on, so... And did they say the mansion or the manor or whatever is based on a real place or no? They did not, but supposedly in the story, like the the great grandmother or gra- won it like in a bet, like a card game bet uh-huh. or something. So it kind of had a like a mysterious start, and it had like a lot of crumbling and like I said, eighty clocks and a lot of weird things going hmm, on nice. with this house. Oh, and they did have like a childhood friend that was also at this. Um, dinner reveal event <laughs> who played like a large part in the family so ah. yeah were they included in the will too pardon me were they in the will too he might have been yeah. i can't remember now i just remember how certain people were excluded and and mm. nana had a very uh, sharp biting sense of truth and humor nice so, yeah hmm. sounds very down to nana heavy. got her jabs in and nana was a, a child <laughs> a children's book author so yeah. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. A lot of interesting okay. characters. Mm-hmm. Excellent. All right. Well, I have two memoirs today because mm. I've been reading a ton of them lately. So mm. let's get a few off the pile. Um, so the first one that I'm going to talk about is Between Two Kingdoms by Suleika Jawad. Mm. Um, so this is a memoir. It's divided into roughly two parts. Um, But the two kingdoms of the title are illness and health. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. So Suleika Jawad uh, was a um, college student at the beginning of the book. She's getting ready to graduate. She doesn't have um, really like a firm plan for the future. Um, And she ends up moving to Paris and getting a job. What she really would like to do is become a war correspondent, but she's not really sure how to accomplish this. So she ends up moving to Paris. She gets a job, um, and she's just kind of living her life in Paris. Um, And she has some things that start to creep in. Um, The first one is like this pervasive itch that starts on her feet and starts to move its way up her legs. And she describes it as feeling like a thousand mosquito bites. Like she just, Mm. and it is just constant. She can't get rid of it. She doesn't know what it is, but she's like 22 and living in Paris. So she's just kind of going about her business being itchy, (laughs) not really doing anything about it. Um, And then starts to creep in this kind of pervasive fatigue um, Mm. where she's just tired all the time. Is it because she's partying too much? Is it because she's working too hard? Maybe. But when you start taking six-hour naps and your naps are not doing anything to ease your fatigue, maybe eventually you end up going to the doctor, uh, which she does. And she's eventually diagnosed with leukemia. Um, So she moves back to the U.S. um, to start treatment for leukemia. Um, And this is the first half of the book, roughly, is um, her diagnosis um, and just going through treatment for this kind of debilitating illness. Um, So she undergoes many rounds of chemo Mm -hmm. um, and eventually a bone marrow transplant, Mm -hmm. which, let me tell you, that learning about what a patient actually has to go through start to finish for a bone marrow transplant is harrowing, and I would not wish it on anyone. Mm -hmm. Um, And while she's undergoing all of this treatment, um, she ends up uh, 
wrangling herself a deal with the New York Times where she writes a column about what she's experiencing, so her experience of illness. Um, and apparently this column had a pretty wide following mm-hmm. um, at the time. Um, and then the second half of the book is roughly, um, you could say recovery, but it's also kind of like, the what now. So she undergoes this bone marrow transplant. She's eventually released from the hospital. They, you know, you're good. You don't have to to be here anymore. You should be like, you're healthy, more or less. Um, And she leaves the hospital and realizes she has no idea what to do with her life because everything has been centered around dealing with her illness for like three years. So she has no job aside from this column. Like she has lost touch with a lot of her friends Mm -hmm. because it's really hard to keep close ties with someone who is in strict medical isolation for months at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, So she's just in this position where she literally has no idea what to do with herself. Um, And what she ends up doing is taking this massive road trip on her own Um, with just her little rescue dog, Oscar. Um, And they pack themselves into a camper van and drive across the country. Um, And what she decides to do is to have stops along the way to visit people that she's corresponded with while she was sick. So there's a bunch of different people, some of whom she knew um, from earlier in her life. Some of them Like one of them is an inmate in Texas who wrote to her in response to one of her columns. They had a little bit of a back and forth correspondence and just a bunch of people um, that she touched through her writing that decided to reach out and she decides to go and actually visit them in person and talk to them. Um, It's a very well-written book. Um, It is kind of brutal a lot of it um because she's dealing with some extremely heavy medical stuff um and makes you know kind of a close circle of friends who are also in treatment for things um some of whom do not have great outcomes and you learn about that and you go through it with her um but it is ultimately a very hopeful book um especially in the second half. Um, And I have a great deal of respect for her sort of resiliency Mm -hmm. and clear eyed, you know, take on life and her ability to look back on herself and her experiences with a little more perspective. Um, So it it was a very popular book when it came out a couple of years ago. Um, I think it actually came out kind of right at the beginning of pandemic, which Mm. sort of, I think it would have been a bigger deal if, you know, book tours were happening and things like that, which, you know, did not. not. (laughs) Um, Especially for a sort of medically slightly fragile person. Um, So I, I highly recommend it um, if you have the kind of, Uh, fortitude for a medically harrowing memoir. Um, I did listen to this one. Actually, both of mine I listened to, and the author does narrate her own audiobook, which I'm always a big fan of. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was a tough read, but a good read. I'm feeling very shallow at this one with everyone. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> nonfiction. Oh, so. stop. No, everyone, you know, you need both. Yes. You you can't just read cancer memoirs every day. Yes, You'll this is true. jump off a cliff. <laughs> we can't have that. No. No, <laughs> no absolutely right. not. So I'm going to kind of lighten it up again. This one yeah. was a little bit darker, um, but it was called Hester by Laurie Lico Albanese. And this kind of brought in like a view of the scarlet letter by Mm. nathaniel hawthorne so the book is a story of isabel gamble she is a young and talented seamstress from scotland that was just happened to be descended from a family of witches 
yeah. you know, as one as is. One is. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> she had the red hair, you know, the whole thing going on. Um, she's also very talented and she has the unique ability, like she does embroidery work, but she can see colors and they have meanings for her. Mm. And she can kind of like sew and transmit secret messages. Mm. So. So her mother has died. Her father is anxious to have her kind of married and settled. You know, this is early 1800s, I believe, um, or maybe even 1700s. So she meets a young apothecary. Um, She marries. And too late, she realizes, you know, this is not the dream boat that she thought he was. He Uh is an opium addict. And Uh he pretty much crashes and burns their entire business. You know, they're thrown into debtor's prison. Yeah, life is not good for um, Isabel and and her husband. So they are running from debts and scandal and sail to the new world to begin a new life together. And they end up in Salem, Massachusetts. So um, the bad thing is, is Hester is stunned to find out, like once they get there, that her husband planned to get back onto the ship and work and go to the Caribbean with them and... He leaves her there alone oh, wow. at a little widow's college cottage um, by herself. <laughs> and he also steals wow. the nest egg that she has put aside to keep herself alive. So, Uh-oh. yeah, he's he's a big swine. Um, yeah. Not a good Sounds guy. Sounds like good riddance to bad rubbish. Yeah. But the problem is, is she's a woman right. alone in, in a colony that... Is kind of suspicious of her. I mean, un- unmarried women brought unease in that culture. Sure. Um, particularly ones that embroider things that, you know, have hidden messages. I mean, this is Salem, you know, land of the witch trials after all. So one of the first people that um, Isabella encounters is a young Nathaniel Hawthorne, who of course is very handsome, but he's tormented by his family's history. Um, but he's also a little vain. You know, he likes his place in society. His family is very prominent, even though, you know, they've kind of, ex- they're not as wealthy as they used to be. But um, they become friends, and then they become lovers. And has uh, Isabel is supporting herself with her needlework. She's befriending other people in the town. There's a very interesting thread because her neighbors are black, and she's noticed like some peculiar behavior about comings and goings. Well, they are kind of running part of the Underground Railroad mm. there. So she delves into that a little bit too. Uh, and I again, I don't want to tell you what happens. You know, her husband does come back. Mm. It really doesn't end well. Um <laughs> Shocking. (laughs) Keep in mind that this book is, you know, the inspiration for the Scarlet Letter and, you know, Hester Prynne. So there may be a child out of wedlock. Mm. So, and what what does Nathaniel do? Um, So it does end hopefully for her, but it doesn't really end in that tied up neatly in a bow. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a... It was kind of a great book for November or, you know, late October. And it kind of gives you that melancholy feel Mm -hmm. that I seem to drift into. You know, I often say November is the time for me to listen to Alice and Krauss and get depressed. But, you know, (laughs) (laughs) particularly all the sad ballads, you know, I I just that Hmm. that's where I go in November. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Yeah. Um, Are you a fan of the Scarlet Letter? Like the actual the original you know, I got to be honest and say I did read it. I had to read it for school. I don't remember a lot of it. Okay. I, I did go to the House of the Seven Gables, though, when wow. I visited Salem recently. So okay. 10 That's points awesome. for that. Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> 10 points for Gryffindor. 10 points for Gryffindor. Um, <laughs> no, I was I was asking because I um, hated that book. I yeah. hated The Scarlet Letter. So I was just curious, um, I guess how one's feelings about the original book might or might not play into this sort of retelling. Yeah, I didn't mm. remember enough about the original mm. book, but okay. men in this story, for the most part, are not great, mm-hmm. you know, as they were not in the in the beginning, in Indeed. the first book either. So, okay. um, yeah, no, no big surprises there. Okay. 
that. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Would you say the the book that you just read has more of an ending, like the movie Scarlet Letter or the book Scarlet Letter? Because I think the book Scarlet Letter did not end on as positive a note. Oh, I don't know. I'm not even sure I saw the movie. Oh, it's good. I liked it. I liked it a lot better than the book. Okay. Who played in the movie? Gary Oldman. Oh. Demi Moore. Oh, okay. Oh, that's that's an that was from like the late '90s, wasn't mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's an old one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I'll have to go back and research that. Thanks, Mindy. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some homework. Yes. There you go. Yes. I nice. don't know. I'm not a big fan of Nathaniel Hawthorne because of what he said about Mary Jane Holmes, and he called her a woman scribbler because she outsold him. Oh. Well, he was kind of vain in this book, so that... It sounds like it's true to form. Yes, yeah. very much so. I was really disappointed in him. It's like, okay, so you love someone, but yet your family history that is supposedly tormenting you makes you make these kind of decisions, and you would just die if, blah, you know... Blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Sorry, that's, like, that's what I've got for Nathaniel Hawthorne. Yeah. Blah, blah, well. blah. <laughs> Yeah, he didn't. He didn't really. He was not the hero of this tale. Excellent. Oh, spoil, spoilers abounding. I, I, I this is horrible. I don't, I don't know that that's too much of a spoiler. No, no. Um, and the book was good. I'm glad mm-hmm. I read it. So, okay. like I said, a good, a great book for this time of year. Mm-hmm. So nice. So excellent. Um, well, if this time of year also makes you want to like curl up with a giant bowl of pasta, um, as it does for me. Oh, I I've think got I the book want for to you, read this one. Which is Taste by Stanley Tucci. Yeah. Nice. Um, okay. Which, again, I listened to, again, narrated by the author, which was excellent. Um, I love Stanley Tucci. Um, and this is, it's not a very, this is a much lighter memoir than my first one. It is not heavy. Um, so this is the story of his growing up and his life all through the lens of food, which I can relate to because my family, like, they don't ask you what you want for your birthday. They ask you what dinner you want for your birthday. (laughs) Like, it's all about food. Um, So Stanley Tucci actually grew up in upstate New York, uh, which who knew? Not western New York, like upstate New York, um, but in a big Italian family. So from the very beginning... Um, his mother was the cook who prepared most of their meals. Um, it sounds like she was a really excellent and inventive cook. Um, but he talks a lot about the food that he ate growing up and how his Italian family, um, influenced his, you know, understanding of food while at the same time, you know, so he's, eating, you know, salami sandwiches, but at school everyone's got like peanut butter and fluff cuz it's what like the <laughs> the 60s. I don't want to I don't want to um make St- Mr. Tucci the wrong age. <laughs> but I have forgotten <laughs> precisely. Um so that kind of juxtaposition between, you know, American and the more traditional Italian food. Um and then he talks about, you know, moving out on his own to New York to try and become an actor. Um, He does not talk too much about his career, except as it relates back to food. So he'll talk about like being on location somewhere Mm -hmm. and like being on location in Iceland and eating in restaurants in Iceland. Or he'll talk about like his favorite restaurants in New York or the bar where he was bartending and he learned to make the perfect martini. Right. Does he talk about Julie and Julia? A little bit. The movie? Yeah. Yep. Um, a little bit. Nice. And he also talks about um, Big Night, which if you haven't ever seen Big Night, highly recommend this movie. It's a little um, like independent movie from maybe the 90s, early 2000s. Um, but it's Stanley Tucci. And now I'm not going to remember any of the other actors' names, but that's fine. But he... Um, plays a chef who with his brother runs this restaurant and the big night in question there's a a famous person that they've heard is going to be at their restaurant so they're like preparing this 
big elaborate meal to try and impress this person because the restaurant is not doing well and they need mm. the publicity. Um, so there's this big thing in the in the movie. They make this dish called timpano, which is like a giant, um, like almost like a pie made out of pasta and meat and cheese, but it's like inside this pastry casing and like you cook it in this big pot and you take it out and cut a giant slice of it. Sounds very low cal. <laughs> yes, indeed. Low carb also. Um, and, and then he talks about how his family has like a tradition with timpano uh -huh. at Christmas time. So everything gets related back to kind of food and family. Um, he does also include a lot of recipes. Nice. So for instance, when he's talking, the chapter where he's talking about timpano, at the end, there is a recipe for like the Tucci family timpano nice. that you can follow. Um, so it, yeah, so he talks about his family, um, shoots, and then the family that he makes as an adult, his first wife and his second wife, all the way up into lockdown. Um, and kind of feeding a family with, at that point, like three teenagers and a couple of kids under 10 during lockdown when you're all home all the time. <laughs> so it was, it was really, um, it was really lovely. And especially if you have an interest in food, please don't bother if you're looking for like celebrity tea. There is none to be had here. This is not that memoir. This is a food memoir. Um, but I really enjoyed it. Did it inspire you to make anything out of there yet? Um, I have not, mostly because I didn't have the, the physical book. Like, uh -huh. I listened to it. So, like, I listened to him talk through the recipe for a timpano, but I did not actually have it where I could be like, oh, let's see if I have all of these things that I can make a timpano to feed my 15 closest friends. <laughs> Um, but there were definitely recipes in there that I was like, oh, that sounds really good. Mm. I, I like a good that. food memoir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Have you read any of the Ruth Reichel ones? I have not. Oh, I like them. Yeah. yeah. I liked Anthony Bourdain's books, too. Mm -hmm. Those were good. And those have been on my list forever, and I haven't gotten to any of them yet. But Kitchen Confidential is it's on my list. I definitely like Kitchen Confidential better than mm -hmm. the other ones. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mindy, for being with us today. Thanks for having me. This Thanks. was a ton of fun. Um, so as always, everyone, please let us know if you've read any of the books that we talked about today and what you thought about them. Um, and if you have any suggestions for us. We do include our email that would be in the show notes mm -hmm. on the podcast. Absolutely. So. so you can always reach out to us with all of your thoughts and opinions by email and we will read it. Um, and just a brief note regarding December. We just have one episode coming to you in December and that will be our best of 2022 episode. So very exciting. Are we going to throw our, some of our reading goals for the next year? Or is that our first one in January? I think we usually talk about that in January, okay. but... Okay. As I was going to say, I haven't formulated my plan yet. No, neither have I. The, uh, <laughs> the end of the year still seems very far away I know. <laughs> at this point. So thank you, everyone. Um, and again, be sure to subscribe to our podcast anywhere that you listen. That does help us quite a bit. And we will see you in December. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you. Book Break is a production of the Grease Public Library, made possible through the support of the friends of the Grease Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Gray.